This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Seeing a presence of a quorum um, this evening, I'm calling to order this meeting of the uh, Regional School Committee at 6.31 p.m. And we'll start with a roll call attendance. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Kenny? Kenny present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. Ms. Spencer? It's a present. Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan present. And McDonald present. And we also have our student rep, uh, Ms. Gribko, joining us. Welcome. Um, and now I will also call to order this meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 6.32 p.m. on November 10th. And we'll start with roll call attendance, Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. And McDonald present. Thank you all. Um, our first item is approving minutes, and I don't believe we have minutes from last week already in our packet. So yep. um, we will. I just want to. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, Ms. Sharkis and I spoke before, um, and I think uh, probably in a week or two we'll have a um, kind of a a bunch of minutes to. She's mostly through them, and we've been meeting every week. So I want to just acknowledge how much work that's been for Ms. Sharkis. Um, but we should be caught up uh, in the next two weeks, and then we'll be able to. Uh, approve them as a bunch. Excellent. Um, welcome, Ms. Seeger. Um, great. So we will move on to public comment. And um, uh, we have one written comment and two voicemails. So I will start with the written comment. Is everybody seeing this? And um, just as a reminder, this will be posted, um, the written comments will be posted on our um, uh, website on the Regional School Committee agendas page of the website. Now I'll play the two voicemails that we received today. Hello there, this is Nina Mankin. I am a parent of a third grader in Wildwood, at Wildwood, and I am first calling to thank you all for all of your hard work and to express my sincere hope that everyone come together, the school committee, the union, and the administration to make plans for outdoor learning this spring that will allow our children to be taught in person. I am personally in support of also bringing children into the schools. I understand the issue with the metrics, um, but I would like to see those metrics based upon evidence that, that the spread 
spread within the schools is um, actually a risk uh, under circumstances where caution is taken and all safety measures are in place. Um, I am in support of the governor's mandate to bring a request for communities to mandate bringing children to in-person learning. And I, I very much hope that Amherst can prioritize that as our goal. And thank you so much. My name is Chris Overtree, and I live in Amherst, and I have four kids in district. Um, I want to share that it makes me very uncomfortable to know that our return to school decisions are being set by a labor negotiation rather than in the more fluid environment where the governor, the Department of Health, and DEFI all have a voice in decision making. What makes our district so different from the others in Western Massachusetts, throughout Massachusetts, and in the private school sector that we can't work to be more in line with the opening practices in other districts? I'm yet another family that is considering leaving the district, not because I'm frustrated in the near term, but because I'm concerned that in the long term, disputes like this will continue to disrupt our children's learning. I believe that as a class of students, children in the Amherst Public School District are being treated unfairly. Their educational needs are wrapped up in a process disconnected from their best interests. Please do everything you can to bring our metrics back in line with the recommendations coming from the governor, the Department of Health, and DEFI. Thank you. Okay, um, so moving on to our next item, we have um, the superintendent's update. So I'll turn that over to you, Dr. Morris. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I've got about six items. Um, so the first one is, uh, and, and I know, you know, maybe some people get sick of me saying this, but I, I'm not going to stop, which is just an appreciation for the work of our facilities and maintenance department, who continues to move forward with plans, despite the fact that we don't have uh, our students in the building save for um, the daycare system, uh, daycare programs that are run, being run right now by LSC and Mark's Meadow uh, Aftercare. We're up to 25 hand, handheld electric, electrostatic sprayers um, that are starting to be distributed to each school. Um, Training is going on for all the custodians to have that. Uh, we'll also be receiving additional five cart sprayers, uh, which has larger capacity and coverage than the handheld units uh, very soon. And this really decreases the time needed to sanitize the um, sanitize and then it increases the amount of area we're able to cover um, to the point of being about five minutes per classroom with those sprayers so appreciate that um, despite all the other challenges that we're facing that our facilities and maintenance folks are continuing the good work um, and continuing to their efforts to be able to uh, appropriately clean and disinfect the schools in a more efficient manner so um, I know I've started with that a couple times, not electrostatic sprayers perhaps, but just other items. Um, but I, I, I do think I can't say those things enough. Uh, second item is we have an event. Uh, it was changed. It was supposed to be on Thursday, but um, one of the presenters had an uh, unexpected change in schedule. So it would be Monday at 630. This was emailed out to all staff and all families this, this uh, afternoon. And it's really looking towards, it doesn't feel like it, but soon it's going to be really cold and cruddy. Uh, and what's already happened is the sun's going down really early. And so what we know is it's going to be a very challenging winter for many folks. And, and these are not our bright folks, but the, um, the folks who are part of that larger organization um, that are therapists and clinicians who are experts in this area. So I'll be kind of moderating, but they're going to do about 20, 25 minutes of presenting uh, and the rest of Q&A and interactive Q&A. So I highly recommend it. I'll say that I'll be part moderator, part observer and listener, because as someone who does not look forward to the cold winter months in general, let alone in times where there may be um, some challenges about ability to do other things, um, you know, I think it's gonna be really something important for the community. And we'd like to make this a series that we do a couple of them because uh, when we did them last spring, there was a lot of community interest. And certainly that didn't happen as we were heading towards a winter. Uh, a COVID winter. So much appreciation for our bright partners on that and just highly recommend um, Courtney and Sarah are great and they've worked both with our staff and, and with our administrative team and been well received by both. Um, there was an email that went out. Uh, this is going to relate to an agenda item later, but it's, it is distinct from it. So I do want um, to return my update. This afternoon, an email went out to all staff from Doug Slaughter, our finance director, and I'll just read it. Good afternoon, ARP staff. Many of the costs associated with making school work during this pandemic were funded by the CARES Act. 
Those funds have been fully utilized and we do not have another stimulus package in sight. This will have implications on our budgets to support those ongoing needs. In response to that need, we are freezing all non-essential spending as of today. This action is necessary in order to be proactive in responding to the uncertainty in the current year as we prepare and as we prepare for next year. Our budgets are built using a variety of sources of income. One critical component is state aid, which is chapter 70. As we look at next year, the ability of the state to support our schools to maintain their current level of services is unlikely. It would be critical for us to conserve our use of funds this year in order to have those resources available for next year. Um, and as we talked about last week, I believe that, you know, in the Amherst and the regional districts, the two districts represented tonight, substantial amounts of funds were taken in addition to what we're bringing in from school choice to be able to fund the budget this year. And as we look to next year, the, the less of that we use, the more we can use for next year's budget. Um, and I think we need to be heading down that road. So we are at this point allowing essential spending. So, you know, for instance, if a student needed a hotspot, we're going to get a make sure a family that family gets a hotspot. It's not that there's no spending. Uh, but it's really at the essential level, um, and that's something we need to do. And, and, you know, again, we'll talk about that a little later when we talk about the presentation last night for the town of Amherst, which has impact on both districts represented this evening. On a more positive note, um, open house last week at the high school was, was outstanding. I want to thank all the high school faculty and staff. Um, for those of you who weren't aware, it was a, and the, the other schools are following suit in terms of format. Uh, it was a, a synchronous session with the administrative team, um, the principal, assistant principals, and athletic director, and then asynchronous videos that um, each teacher did into different departments to talk about what the curriculum was, what's happening. Uh, and it was really well received. Um, so I really want to thank Talib, Sam, Mickey, uh, and Victoria for leading the charge and being the first to go. And um, the other ones are mostly on Tuesday and Thursday of next week. Um, but I think in a virtual world, it's a really nice format because everyone gets to have the whole group experience and then it's pick and choose for your child's classes, your child's teachers to be able to have that. So really, really great start and uh, thank the high school again for their maiden voyage on this. Um, one piece of feedback relating to an agenda item from last week about our curriculum day uh, and the diversity, equity, and inclusion work that happened that day. Uh, we did, uh, Tim Sheehan organized a survey that went out uh, to get feedback from staff. And, and the short story is the feedback was very positive. Uh, and there was a numeric rating attached to it out of five. And uh, I think there was 180 response, something like that. And it was a 4.5 out of five rating from staff for the value and importance um, and engagement they had during that morning. So, you know, thank you to Doreen and Tim and everybody who organized that day. And it was great to see the positive feedback come in. Uh, my last item is just um, as, as was shared with the school committee and was shared with the public last week, um, Desi came out with guidance on metrics and focusing on in-person um, learning. I want to be clear that I had a conference call with Desi about this as did all superintendents across the Commonwealth. Um, they're clear they have no jurisdiction to change local decisions. Um, they did say they, they may comment on local decisions and express concerns about local decisions, but um, they don't have, it's not in their jurisdiction to overturn whatever decisions made locally. Um, on a personal level, you know, I just want to say, I think for folks who have been following this discussion since June, since we started talking about it, I think it comes as no surprise to anyone that, you know, I'm much happier when kids were in buildings. Those seven days were, were fabulous. And, you know, um, I think last week I got some feedback that my, the presentation on distance learning was was perhaps perceived to be uh, that I was suggesting that it was preferable. Distance learning was preferable to having kids in buildings. And I think, you know, anyone can go back and watch the meetings. And, and I think my opinion has been pretty clear on that topic. Uh, and, you know, the comments are really framed in terms of the current agreement that, that is had. And we continue to support all, uh, explore all options to have students get more in-person learning, um, you know, and, and we're still looking at what options are out there. Um, and, you know, I think next week, maybe I'll come back with some additional thoughts about um, that topic. But I just wanted to clarify that because I know I got some emails and some feedback that I wanted to share with that. And that is my update for this evening. Happy to answer any questions if there are any. Any any comments or questions from the committee? Mr. Denley? Yeah, um, so on the DESE uh, communication, the continuing, the evolving DESE communication, um, I didn't see this in their email weekly update, but there have been, um, uh, depending on what the week, and it sort of seems to be like a stock market curve where it's getting slightly increased over time. Um, so this
consistent of um of, of the legality of certain models as to whether um you know if if children are in a fully remote setting for an extended period of time are you legally meeting the educational obligation you know FAPE and and all that and you know there's been some interesting lawsuits of um outside the country and outside the state um so i don't know if you'd heard anything about that whether the commissioner gives guidance about about uh about that or or, or if superintendents talk to each other about about what the, what the state of affairs is with those kinds of kinds of things generally speaking yeah i think what we've seen in general has been a main focus uh and probably the strongest desi comments have been focused on uh particularly students with intensive needs who don't have access uh to the curriculum without in-person learning so um I think that's an open conversation that um, I've heard around the state. Again, they don't have jurisdiction, but that doesn't mean that um, we, like we did last summer, won't owe compensatory services um, over time and, and whether parents you know, take action on that, right? I can't comment on that one, but certainly um, that's one that's been pretty clear. You know, We were surveyed by the state. They are uh, collecting information on distance learning plans uh, of everyone because everyone could be in distance, even if they're not at the moment, they could be in the future. Um, and I think the state is compiling those and going to share those out sometime in the next week or two. Um, I know it was requested in the joint hearing that happened a week and a half ago, I want to say. Um, so the state has, um, Tim and I, Tim Sheen and I worked on that last week. And uh, what they'll do with that data is is not totally clear to me, but it'll certainly be public data uh, once they compile it and and publish it. And um, I think that conversation will continue that you that you referenced, Peter. Any other questions? Oh, actually, I'm sorry. There is one thing that I wanted to share. So one thing that we're just trying to get better at as we we, we do uh, learn from our experiences is, uh, you know, we published the results, the full results that were only redacted in terms of identifying information of the distance learning survey last week in the newsletter. But one thing we did that we haven't done in the past is we shared the student feedback back directly with 7th through 12th grade students. Um, you know, as they're the only sort of demographic that doesn't, necessarily get the newsletter um, on Friday afternoons. We wanted to make sure that when students complete a survey, that they're actually seeing the full full spectrum of responses. So, you know, it's just one way that, you know, it was pointed out to us and it was completely right that, you know, the general principle is if you ask people to take a survey, they should be able to see the, the data. And uh, that was sort of applying to everyone except our most, you know, respectfully to all of us, our precious resource, which is our students. So we're gonna start institutionalizing that where when students um, take a survey, we guarantee them um, unless it's something really private or personal, like a mental health screener or something like that. But if it's something like, you know, like this kind of survey, we want to make sure that we share that back. So that was emailed out, um, I think, on Friday as well um, to all, all students. So um, I just wanted to share that because it's a, it's a good feedback loop we get, and, and we implement some good suggestions we get from the community, and that was one of them. Great. Any other questions from committee? Not seeing any. Um, so we'll move on to our next item, which is um, a chair's update. Um, and I know I've been skipping my updates um, for the last several meetings, but tonight I would like to um, offer some some uh, comments and thoughts. Um, as all of us on the committee are well aware, we've been getting high volume of email and comments um, from the community. Um, many are from anguished parents. Um, struggling with um, our current distance learning um, and pleading with us um, to find a way for in-person learning. And as Dr. Morris just mentioned, there we continue to explore options. Um, but I'd like to take a moment tonight to try to respond to some of the specific questions that we're getting from many in the community about the process for how we can address the decision framework and metrics in our approved MOA with the teachers union or the APEA. Many people are asking about whether the Joint Labor Management Safety Committee, also known as JLMSC, is an avenue for discussing and potentially modifying the metrics and decision framework. Um, in fact, the JLMSC is charged with discussing how the improved MOA is, is being implemented and addressing any concerns about the implementation. I mean, we do have an item later on the agenda this evening to talk specifically about that. While the JLMSC, in theory, could address items within the MOA, such as constraints or issues around implementation, if ultimately that group thinks that a change is needed to anything within the MOA language itself, that would require both the Regional School Committee and the APEA 
to agree to reopen negotiations about that item. The JLMC is not a bargaining committee, and it's not empowered to bargain on behalf of either the Regional School Committee or the APEA. This is why we, the Regional School Committee, have asked the APEA twice to reopen negotiations. And some um, in the community have seen this letter, but I'd like to share now um, what our most re recent request was, which I sent on behalf of our committee a week ago. So I'm going to read from that letter now. Thank you for the, this was addressed to the APEA Executive Board. Thank you for the responses to our request to reopen negotiations on the MOA, specifically around the decision frameworks and metrics for opening and closing in-person schooling. We're disappointed that the APEA Representative Council voted to decline our request to re-engage in conversations on these items in the MOA. This action is unlike what is happening in Agawam, where the union and school committee have agreed to reopen the metrics clause in their MOA after similarly experiencing the disruptive impact of those metrics once implemented. The decision metrics for in-person schooling in our MOA are so different from all surrounding districts that while an increasing number of these districts are successfully moving to return their students to in-person learning, our schools are moving in the opposite direction. We are particularly concerned that our highest need students who lack full access to distance learning do not have the opportunity for in-person learning, which undoubtedly will add to the educational debt in our district. We're also concerned that three of the four communities within our district have each had six or fewer total cases. And, and this was written a week ago. I haven't looked to update this for um, current metrics, um, but had very few COVID cases during the entire pandemic, and yet their students are being denied in-person education. Furthermore, the town of Amherst currently, as of last week, had fewer active cases than a month ago and is now in the green on the state map. The community outcry is clear. We, the district, the school committee, and the APA need to do better. Together, we have the opportunity to better serve our students' needs. We are all dedicated to our students, and the school committee is committed to helping heal any wounds that exist between our groups, including through a restorative process if the APEA is interested. We acknowledge the Joint Labor Management Safety Committee provides us a pathway to address concerns around implementation of the protocols and the provision of the resources described in the MOA. However, reopening the MOA is our only path forward to better serve our students and their families, as any changes would need to be considered and approved by both the full APEA and the full school, full school committee. We hope the APEA leadership is willing to reconsider and collaborate with the school committee in discussions around the MOA. Our communities are requiring action to meet the needs of our students, especially those who are most vulnerable, and we believe we need to act now. That was our, the letter that we sent last week. Um, we also, not stated in that letter, we also fully support the APEA request for transparent and public negotiations. And we do look forward to hearing from the APA and getting started very soon. Mr. Dowling. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, uh, so I've been getting the same questions. <laughs> so I really appreciate you just articulating the process like that. So. Um, so a couple of like very short follow-up questions, just to clarify the process, because I, I feel like this is good to good opportunity to, to to clarify that. So so has has there been so we, we made two requests, the school committee made two requests to the APA to executive board to uh, talk about um, uh, renegotiating the MOA. Um, the first one was declined, and and the second one is still. And like, so have we, have we received a response on the on the second one yet that, that was submitted last week? We have not. Okay. Um, and so so the JLMSC, um, so are, are you saying that even if people sat down and were very cordial and productive and had very um, uh, collaborative ideas and came to agreements, that, that that are you saying that that can't change the MOA? The only thing that can change, the MOA, the only thing that can change the metrics for reopening, the the automatic two weeks of closure, all the all the things we've been hearing about in public. The only thing that can change that is if both parties agree to talk about and change it. Is that is that correct? That that is correct. So the JLMSC may come to a conclusion that they would like to recommend that we reopen negotiations, but only if we reopen negotiations and 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 have our bargaining teams discuss those those aspects can the MOA language be changed. Thank you. 
Are there any other questions or comments um, from the committee on this? I'm seeing none. So we'll um, move on now to school committee announcements. Does anybody from the committee have an announcement? Mr. Demling. Yeah, uh, so we had a CPAC meeting last Friday, a monthly um, a meeting of the Special Ed Parent Advisory Council. Um, and uh, as you might expect, uh, most of the discussion was around um, uh, remote learning and the, the experiences of parents uh, with that. And uh, so I, I just wanted to share the sort of the two main points, the two main themes that, that members uh, expressed. It was a public meeting, but I, th I thought it was good to, given our discussions here, for, the, for that to be um, made aware here. So the, um, you know, the, 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 the main point um, from the, uh, we were hearing from parents is that, you know, we have we have dozens of, of high need students who are not getting any benefit from remote learning. And this this is, uh, you know, members at CPAC, we are very, you know, cognizant to say that this is not to say that students who don't have intensive special needs aren't also struggling with remote learning. Um, you know, they know, they know they're not the only students who are who are having difficulty, but um, but for for a few dozen um, families, uh, students with really intensive special needs, um, there's no benefit from the current model, um, and so you're seeing a lot of struggle and a lot of uh, regression, frankly, um, which is difficult. And so so therefore, this so this is this is this came in the broader discussion of why is CPAC asking the school committee and the APEA to please get together to talk about changing the MOA. And it's, it's because of this, it's because even if we have a model that is working to some degree for most, it's definitely not working for a few dozen students and a few dozen of our highest need students. Um, you know, one, one member, um, you know, this is difficult to, to hear, but sort of uh, related it back to, you know, 40, 50 years ago before federal law, um, you know, Brought faith into existence, this free and appropriate public education. You know, students were 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 very much excluded from from mainstream education. Students with intensive special needs, and you know, institutionalized and and sacrificed essentially. Um, you know, their education was was completely sidelined, and it 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 has that feel. Um, and um, a lot there were a lot of comments um, about this. This is not trying to blame any person or group or individual. Um, you know, a CPAC is a, is, is a parent support group, um, uh, and yet really wanting the community to understand that we have students who are and families who are really struggling as a result of this. Um, the other um, point that was made, kind of related to that, is that um, while uh, getting at home services is is better than not getting any services at all, it's it's not a replacement for services in the building for these students. And it's for a few reasons. You know, one is, um, you know, the student experience of of education and of receiving those services is is markedly different uh, in a home environment versus the school environment. There's a lot of education and other reasons for that. But you know, point being is that it's 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 uh, it's received and experienced differently by the student, and and not not in a in a in a, in a helpful manner uh, when you're in, in that much of a different environment. The other thing is that it's, it's very disruptive for for families. Uh, you know, to have one or more people in your home every day delivering student uh, services um, uh, and, you know, affecting the life of yourself and your spouse and your other children can be really difficult, you know. And, and you know, third is that it we're asking these families to accept a higher level of COVID risk, um, inviting staff into their home uh, to deliver these services. And, you know, unless you have an HVAC system in your home, your air exchange at home is significantly less than than the minimum of four that we get at our our, our building uh, room. So you know, all that's to say is that uh, it's 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 a really challenging situation, um, and CPAC is is really trying to um, make it clear that this is this is not about a fight. This is not about um, blaming, uh, but but these these students and these families are struggling, and that we need to find a way. Um, to to push this ball forward um, as, as as we try and figure out um, everything else that we're trying to figure out. So just another point of view for the conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Uh, 
not seeing any. We'll move on. Okay, uh, Dr. Morris. Yeah, just, just as a note, you know, the EPA recommends an air exchange rate in the home of 0.35 air changes per hour, you know, because because of what I just wanted to note, you know, and add just a little bit to what Peter said. So in our in our classrooms that we we have four or greater for our use, um, and it's significantly different because homes aren't designed the way school buildings are with HVAC systems. I just it's not it's just adding to to what Peter said in terms of some context and and some detail. Um, that they really they, they function quite differently, and, and that's why most people don't have like univents in their homes um, that way because they're not they're not designed for larger groups of of people that come from different places that don't live all in the same place, so uh, in the same home. So I just wanted to share it because I think the numerical comparison might be helpful. Thanks. Okay, so we'll move on now to our new and continuing business. Um, and our first item is advocacy work or discussing advocacy work um, for maintaining funding in um, fiscal year 22. So we are just embarking on um, that process. Um, so I'm gonna uh, I'll look to our, our newly appointed um, state school committee member, um, <laughs> um, if he would like to introduce or kick off the discussion on this topic. I feel like I'm hogging the mic here, so I'll try to be brief, um, brief on the intro. So the advocacy slash budget landscape right now, in a word, is chaos. <laughs> um, it's obviously COVID throws everything into chaos, but um, I think the Ways and Means budget for FY21 just came out today. Uh, and so FY21, the, the year that started on July 1st, this, this past July 1st, the one that we're in, um, they still don't have a state budget for, right? And we're all we're all doing this with our current FY um, 21 budget, and that's going to scream along at at a breakneck pace. Um, and then the year will flip over, and then the FY 22 budget um, will, will will kick in, which is which is what this topic is. So, um, I, and obviously, you know, what just happened last week, or what what the Vegas aggregate betting odds say is 91% chance of what happened last week, which is Joseph Biden was <laughs> elected the president. But, and, and we still don't know, and we won't know until January what the Senate is. All that means is that um, the prospects for a large and immediate um, uh, st stimulus and support to state budgets uh, has, the chances, chances for that have decreased um, in, in the last couple of weeks than, than what people were hoping for, right? And so so who, who is really to say what is going to happen at the end of the day to our FY22 budget? And, and everyone is going to, you know, and if it's severe situation, everyone's gonna be hurting and everyone's gonna be running around looking for those small pieces of pie. And so, you know, what, so what can we do, <laughs> right? Out here in the boonies of Western Mass. Um, you know, I, th I think there will be specific things that come along. Um, I know, I know, MCAS, um, a moratorium on. I know this isn't budget, but in terms of advocacy for for this year and for next year, um, there's a uh, MCAS moratorium resolution going around. I think um, Mass Association School Committees just passed it. I know MTA is very much in support of it. Um, Joe Comerford has a bill, so I'm sure that will cross our desk at some point. Um, as far as the other stuff, it's really hard to say. You know, what is going to make a difference? Um, when, when I sort of take a step back about, you know, where should we focus our energy in order to retain the most dollars for next year? Um, I, I, I come back to this principle of if we, the more students that we retain, the more students that come into our schools in FY22, the more dollars we're going to retain, right? And, and that's not just a direct result of chapter 70, right, which is based on enrollment, um, but 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 it's also what we lose to other schools, in particular charter schools. So I, I don't I haven't been keeping track of it, but we we got kind of lucky this year with the remote status of the local charter schools, which which just in my opinion I think played a, a role in the degree to which we lost enrollment or didn't lose enrollment to to charter schools this year. Um, I don't think that our luck will last that long into next year if if we are in the current same. Um, mostly remote mode. Um, so uh, I feel like we kind of have a reprieve on that, fortunately. Um, and so when we start thinking about 
FY22 and what we can do. Yes, you know, it's good to have like one page resolutions of don't uh, underfund hold harmless or, you know, fund regional transportation reimbursement. Those are all good things. And, and when other districts start to do statewide things, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that and, and pull us in when, when, when that opportunity arises. But, but I, I think if we're trying to think about increasing the, the dollar budget, it, we should really try to be focused more on how do we retain and get the families who have left back to our district, which kind of relates to the next agenda topic item. Um, those are my initial thoughts. I don't really have like a, a super clear, sharp, this is how we get the dollars plan, um, but it's that's my best um, stab at a, a flashlight through the, the current chaos. Um, I don't know if Dr. Morris or Ms. McDonald, you had any other um, thoughts on that as it was per way of intro? Yeah, I, I think there was, we talked, I think it was um, at our meeting last week. For, so for those that haven't been glued to the screens and watching every one of our meetings, um, the I think we talked about the action, the sort of insight that we've gotten or that Dr. Morris, you've gotten on, on the hold harmless um, that and maybe you could speak to that again, um, that it may not be as as the same situation as, as usual. Sure, yeah, and I tried and mostly failed last night at the Amherst Town Council or joint meeting to, to say this. Uh, so uh, I wanna thank, you know, uh, particularly Representative Dom, who's been on this and communicating with me frequently, as well as Senator Comerford. Um, I know Representative Blay also has been involved because we are not unique in having a significant decline in our enrollment. And so the major concern about Chapter 70 next year is how is that going to be appropriated or how is that going to be dealt with? Because the, the declines every year, there's you know some ups and downs. We've had declining enrollment for 15 years or whatever it is, but, but not this precipitously. Um, and we also think it might be temporary. So we've surveyed, a survey went out yesterday or today, something like that yesterday. Uh, to families who have left our district, and so we're going to try to ascertain some data on who plans to return. Um, I know that Rep. Dom has uh, met with the chair of the Education Commission, Rep. Paish, um, and kind of talked about her concerns. I know um, the Education uh, Committee has received those concerns from multiple legislators and are working towards some resolution on this, but um, I guess my concern, not to be a not to be negative tonight, uh, is that um, in typical times, I'd feel really confident about the state's capacity to be able to do this fairly and equitably. Um, these are not typical times and the resources probably are declining, uh, will be declining for education dollars next year. So, and we have a Student Opportunity Act that's that's not really been implemented, that's around equity uh, and all the things that philosophically we all agree on. So that that, that mix is concerning to me because I really, it's hard to predict how that's gonna turn out. Um, so, you know, I do wanna appreciate the work of our legislators in trying to make sense of this, but they can't print money. And so that's the concern is that in a year where resources are sparse, they may have some, they will have some very difficult decisions to make. So I think people are understanding the situation. It's been communicated from districts like ours and others to representatives. I know they're talking about what to do with it, but you know, the pie is not getting larger, and that's going to make some uh, for some very challenging, very significant challenges. And that's to Mr. Dunling's point earlier: is it's really hard. There's not a linear path of what to advocate for, how to advocate, because as he noted, you know, there's a significant between, difference between the governor's budget and the House Ways and Means. On Thursday, I believe the Senate Ways and Means is coming out with their budget for FY21. So we're not even close to thinking through you know, what the impact will be in FY22, other than we know that there will be some, but it's it's hard when we're not, usually at this point in the budget cycle, FY21 would be something that was decided months ago. The fact that it's still being debated in November, uh, and that's not a critique of the legislatures, it's the situation we're in. Um, it makes it really hard to know what advocacy efforts would work. So I think at this point, we've communicated to our local legislators the concerns, they've taken action to bring this to the Edu House Education Committee. And I think, uh, you know, once we get through FY21, I think that's probably the time to really ramp up. I'm um, trying to understand what the lay of the land will be for FY22 and where the advocacy needs to go. Thank you. 
I don't think I have anything more to add that was helpful. Um, does any anybody have questions or, or thoughts that they'd like to share? No, not seeing any. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to the next item, um, which is exploring um, our uh, discussion on the FY22 school calendar and school year structure. Um, and I, this, this item was introduced, or this idea was introduced um, by a community member at Public Comment um, several meetings ago, um, and, and sort of in recognition of the fact that it may be a while before we actually achieve enough or sufficient vaccination rates in our community to be able to um, consider full-time uh, full time in person in school buildings um, learning, um, and that we may be sort of faced with sort of our COVID um, era scenarios um, and planning for in school. And are there ways that we can rethink our school year structure to enable um, greater um, time on learning in um, warmer weather that it might be more conducive to outdoor um, and, and limiting? Um, the time that we are in the winter. At least that's how I recall the, the suggestion or proposal being presented to us. And so we wanted to, um, this evening, have that conversation about whether this is something that the school committee would like to explore um, and begin discussions on. Um, obviously it will take, if we do embark on this, it will take um, some, some amount of discussions and planning and, and, um, and thinking well ahead of, of the spring so that, um, not just discussions with our with our unions, um, but also um, so that families can be prepared and 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 make their plans for the summer and the fall as well. Um, so I just kick that off. Um, and again, our our point tonight is to discuss and understand whether this is something that the committee would like to explore. Ms. Spitzer. So I actually think I brought this up um, when we were voting on our calendar. Um, several um, months, maybe weeks ago. And, and I feel the same way about it as I um, did then, which is that I, I think to the extent possible, because of the, what we're seeing right now, which is, you know, I, I'm not an expert on this, but my lay person understanding is that, that hopefully the, that vaccine that, you know, is getting tested out by Pfizer. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic, but I think we should plan for some, what might be the worst case scenario where, we, where we're not in a situation where we have a vaccine. Um, and so I think to the extent we can, even if it's not a complete, you know, flipping of the calendar to the extent that we can create, you know, flexibility around our, you know, think about changing our breaks, um, think about ways in which we can, um, maximize the amount of time that students are in the building during the, especially the spring and the fall um, when you can open the windows and maybe because one of the things that we're not thinking about is how our buildings get really 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 hot and I don't know and I'm actually this is a question maybe for um, Superintendent Morris or I'm looking at uh, Mr. Harrington right now is whether or not all of these improvements that we've been making to our HVAC system are going to have any improvements on our ability to cool our buildings. Um, because I think right now it's great that we have one tent per school, but there's no way one tent per school is enough to allow for outdoor learning in August, you know, for, for all of our children who would like to have educating. So I guess what I'm saying is, yes, let's continue to explore this. And I'm concerned about the cooling implications and also I just flag for, um, you know, our community is a little bit unique because we have so many folks who are on an academic calendar and um, folks who work in the universities. I'm curious about how disruptive this might be to their um, students and their families' learnings. I think before we explore sort of implications of changing it, let's sort of get a sense from the rest of the committee about how, you know, is this something that we want to explore? And then we can move on to thinking it through sort of what are the implications and challenges and, um, in doing that. What are um, other folks' thoughts? Ms. Seeger? I'm definitely interested in exploring this some more. I think it's it's a good s potential solution, or not solution, but step in a direction to to have students more in person during a time of year that it's definitely easier to be. Thank you. 
Any other thoughts on, on, on whether we should explore this? Mr. Sullivan? Yeah, I mean, if, if we're looking at a summer that was anything like last year, where there really weren't any camps or anything, we might as well, you know, give families the option of sending their students to school early just so they have, you know, some some socialization and are able to do something because last summer was a mess for all families. So I'm seeing head nodding and um, hearing comments, Mr. Denling. Yeah, so um, I, I'm I'm quite interested in exploring the bounds of this idea. Um, I'm I'm very cognizant that that we might hit practical roadblocks of this is why you can't do everybody in mid July or 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 or, or whatnot. Um, and I, I understand that it's it's a cost benefit analysis, right? And so, to, so to, to me, I think of it as, as the, the cost of risking kids not being in person uh, during a regular school year versus the benefit of having them earlier. And, you know, living through this year, I see the cost of, um, of kids being remote continually as very high. <laughs> and so to, to me, this is one of those classic, the perfect is not the enemy of the good. I, I am sure that there are a host of headaches <laughs> and problems, maybe not all solvable, that Dr. Morris and um, Mr. Harrington and, and, and his colleagues uh, would, would have to work through. And maybe we get to a point where we say, you know what, you, you just can't do certain aspects of this. But, um, but I, I really think that it's worth the creative exploration to push, our shell, push our, ourselves to determine what is possible. Um, and you know, the, the, other, the other side benefit of, of, of this too is that I think come next late spring, early summer, you know, everybody's gonna be wondering about what is school going to look like and will we actually get in person and to what extent will we get in person the next school year? And um, if, if, the, if, the par if parents in general are, are less trusting of our ability to make that happen next year. Um, I, I think that would be reasonable, <laughs> you know, given, uh, again, I'm not trying to like be negative or blame anybody, but you know, we, we've so, so far have not achieved our goal of maximizing in-person learning, right? Um, other than the seven days. So, um, so there's gonna be a lot of unease, I think, and um, uncertainty. And when you have parents that are making essentially a year-long enrollment decision, um, I can see an advantage, you know, assuming that we're, we're doing it in a really responsible, high-quality way, I can see the advantage of wanting to get more parents locked in earlier on in the summer than having them get to, you know, beginning of mid-August and then having to make those really painful decisions again about, you know, do I have my son or daughter do this outside of ARPS or, or not. Um, you know, especially with, 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 with the hope, hopeful, if, if, you know, depending on next year goes well, uh, the hopeful return of, an, of a number of parents to the district. So, um, you know, that also factors in my thinking. I, again, I, I really, I don't want to jump the gun on this, but, but I, I do want to, uh, I, I think it's worth some, some creative exploration. Uh, Ms. Lord. I'm gonna be the optimist here for a moment um, and ask about, will there be flexibility? Cause let's say by April, our surrounding towns and our, or our county is 85% immunized and we're actually good to go back to something that looked a little bit more like last year. Like, will there be flexibility to switch if we decide on the summer schedule? So I'm, um... Seeing, um, just to, to recap what I'm hearing from the committee, I'm hearing um, and seeing from body language, um, a general um, strong interest in, in exploring this. Um, and so several, several of us have raised sort of questions about sort of the practicality and sort of where we might have challenges. So um, Dr. Morris, you had your hand up earlier on um, responding to that. Yeah, so I, I don't love being the person who's like the cold water guy waiting outside, but I feel like I, I will be like, I'll have that role a little bit today. Uh, and none of what was said was do I disagree with, but um, 
So one is just, you know, in terms of like the comments today that I saw that, you know, a vaccine to be readily available perhaps by April, that's for adults, it's not for children, right? And so I do want to caution us that maybe that'll change between now and then. But right now, my understanding is the vaccine is only being tested on adults. And so I'm not suggesting that's not a huge step if adults were vaccinated. But when we're talking about kids, um, right now, my understanding is, and I'm happy to be corrected, uh, like super duper happy, that, that that's probably further out in our thinking, uh, collective thinking about when that would occur. So I do want to caution us about um, timeline uh, around vaccines. Um, I also wonder, and this is, you know, I, I always do this and probably uh, to her dismay, but I would love to have Ms. Gripko, uh, if she wants to comment on this one, comment. But I do know that students may be really excited to come back to in-person learning and still need a break. Our school year right now runs until I think June 24th. It's pretty late. So I also want to balance that, you know, um, whether those are in-person in the spring or not in-person, just making sure that we're, we're thinking about the student experience and what level of detachment from academic learning that our students need, because I want to make sure that balance is right. Um, the third point I wanted to make was just that um, for some families, they may be enabled to um, see other family members that they're not visiting right now with the current situation. So I just also want to balance that they're, for some family members, they're not visiting their family in Thanksgiving. They're not visiting their family over if they celebrate December holidays. And summer may be a time where, again, vaccine for adults, like lots of opportunities. Hopefully our, our world's a safer world at that point. So, um, and some of those trips may not be local, right, for people who, who have family in other countries. So I just want to be balancing. Again, none of these are saying we shouldn't pursue it. I just, um, again, uh, try not to play that role tonight, but I am. I do think I appreciate the committee bringing this up now because there's a whole local industry uh, of summer camps. Um, that would might have to adjust to any changes that the committee or the community makes. So I think now is the time to start being start talking about this because I, I we can't make decision based on local industry. And I also want to be a good neighbor and partner to some of our you know some people partners with us, with us during the school year. So uh, to that end, I guess the last thing I'd say is I do not believe our cooling capacity has been significantly influenced. Um, and I think if the committee wants to pursue this an action step, because I, I promise I wasn't just going to do the cold water, I was going to get to an action step, uh, would be to perhaps request from the town council funds for um, someone to come in and explore what the cost and the timeline of increasing the cooling capacity of the schools would be. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, our facilities department is doing tremendous amounts of other work right now. Um, it's not that the people don't have that expertise, but I think we'd want an outside resource because that would have to be work that was done by an outside contractor. That's beyond the scope of and, and human power that we have locally uh, within our department. So, you know, if this is something that the committee wanted to pursue, it might want to see if there's, um, it's a little complicated with our multiple districts, but if there was uh, funding for almost like a, a quasi, you know, facilities feasibility study um, to take, to talk about this, those folks, my friends in Pelham know that we've, Sort of talked about this. There's a couple of classrooms in Pelham that are highly problematic. I know this is in a Pelham meeting, but I think it actually relates to this conversation. Um, so, you know, I think that would be the action step. I don't, if we don't increase our cooling capacity, we certainly have schools where I don't think it would be comfortable to be in for much of the summer months. You know, Crocker, where we have our summer program, we don't love using Crocker every summer for our summer program at the elementary level. We do it because it's the only space that has cooling and it's a much better, you know, that way. It would actually be great to rotate the schools. That would be ideal because then Crocker would get a break and custodians would be able to pull things out and not feel rushed at the end of the summer. We do that because Wildwood and Fort River would be very, very difficult to be in all summer for instruction. Um, and, and I think one could argue the middle school and high school have certain parts of the school that are air conditioned that would work well. In certain parts that don't. And I think additional complication and why we'd want professional expertise is that putting in window units, you know, for those of you who study this, actually has uh, a net negative impact on ventilation. Uh, and in COVID times, that would be highly problematic as a potential. I'm not suggesting that was anyone's answer, but I know what I do know is that's not a good answer right now um, yeah. for cooling. So um, that was really long winded, but I had a lot to say. Uh, and, and I'll take away the cold water and say that it totally makes sense to pursue this. I just don't know how realistic and feasible it is. And I think we would want someone to come in and help us think about that uh, from a operational and perspective and get a real cost to it. 
um, because I think the idea of it could be good. And if you're sitting in a classroom at Fort River in 95 degree weather, it's going to having nothing to do with COVID. It's going to seem like less of a good idea uh, than it does right now where, you know, probably in a week will be, you know, the nights will be in the twenties and, you know, you don't worry about the cooling so much. So, and Mr. Harrington knows more about this than me. So he is, should be enabled to say that, uh, to pour hot water on my cold water and tell me I'm all wrong. And I will go with whatever he says. Well, I, I think before we go there, I think, um, there's, there's, there's a whole great, there's a whole spectrum between saying that we want to explore a different calendar structure that is, you know, could be being in school summer versus rethinking and sort of maybe just moving two weeks earlier and and rethinking how we space our holidays, which I think was part of what Ms. Spitzer was suggesting, right? So is there opportunity if we start sort of, you know, August 15th, I don't know if that's a middle of the week, it's Saturday, but, you know, middle of August, you know, just shift our calendar two weeks earlier, shift some of our curriculum is to later, um, at, you know, wherever possible or, or, you know, and bunch up our holidays um, sort of later in, in the in the semester so that, and then take a longer break then, right? And then maybe skip a February vacation because we bunched it and moved it into January or, you know, just sort of rethinking creatively how we're doing school that may or may not require us to, um, to invest in being in schools in July. Um, and still sort of enable, you know, at least six weeks of vacation um, and time off for folks. I don't know. So I, but I think that 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 part of the conversation also needs to happen is sort of what are some of our options from, you know, starting on Labor Day versus starting on July 1st or whatever. Right? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's helpful. And I'm sorry if I was overly dramatic, but, you know, I think uh, I did want to suggest that, you know, I would even say that if we want to go down the road of mid-August, I would still recommend that we get some analysis because um, those of you who remember not that long ago, granted our cooling system failed, but you know we had a hard time in all of our schools, not just Wildwood, where we had that extremely hot week to start the school year. And you know, I, I don't, I'm not a weatherman. I, I don't have the data on this, but I, I do think you're more likely to get a row of really hot days in mid-August than you are in early September. Um, at least it feels that way. Um, so uh, I'm not saying it would cost $2 million and we're going to get fully air conditioned spaces, but having a real good sense of what it's going to be like um, if we start earlier and what, what are some mitigation strategies for cooling, I still think would be a wise idea. But again, if Mr. Harrington disagrees with me, I'll go with what he says. Mr. Harrington. So first off, I do not disagree, but um, what, what, I, what I would add to that is that like there's kind of an urgency around that. Like, like a study like that is, is going to take some time. Again, that's not something that, that we necessarily have the manpower to do in-house. So, so I would say that aspect of the conversation should probably start like now. And then, and then kind of uh, adding on to everyone else's points, I, you know, I think we definitely have to have this discussion because maximizing in-person time, learning time is, is I mean, that, that's imperative at this point. That's that's pretty much what everyone seems to want. And it's definitely what we all need. Ms. Spitzer? Wrong button, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask um, a kind of a clarifying question is, I feel like there are two things that I would love to know more about. One is what are the days that were legally mandated or contractually obligated that they need to be off. For example, um, we had just had looking at what's happening in the colleges, like they're not taking Indigenous Peoples Day. They're not taking Veterans Day at you know our local college, Amherst College. They've consolidated the calendar to be very short. So it would be helpful to know, and, and maybe this is, this is something that's cost free, I'd hope. I know it takes some hours, probably from admin, but if we could just get kind of like, these are the days, like we're not gonna ask people to come in and work on Christmas. We're not gonna ask people to come in and work on Thanksgiving, but these are the holidays that maybe we could turn into a learning day. And then also, I feel like there would be some risk in doing this on our own, like being the only district to move in this direction. So I don't know how we could tap into this, maybe through the MASC, but see, are other folks interested in moving down this road? road 
particularly in our community. Because the other thing I think is, you know, we've seen that sports are something that's giving our kids a lot of, you know, ex socialization. And I'd hate to move our calendar in such a way that would preclude them participating in, in athletics. So those are just my, my two things that if we could get some more info would be really helpful as we explore this. Dr. Morris. Yep, so the first one I can definitely find out for you. Um, in terms of our contract, our contracts with our bargaining units are all ending on June 30th. So that's something that could be discussed with bargaining units. Um, I can certainly check in with area superintendents on the calendar. I think MASC is a good idea as well, but I'm happy to check in with other superintendents, you know, because all the contracts, uh, collective bargaining contracts um, have clauses in it. It's not as easy as school committee or superintendents voting. It would have to be something that would be bargained. On the last point, as athletics, uh, I don't disagree with the larger point, but athletics go on even during December break. So I don't think that should be such a barrier um, because it, it, the athletics continue when the school year, uh, when students are on break. So if the breaks happen at different times, it might be inconvenient, but it's not, it doesn't like it precludes them from happening. I guess a, a question also to sort of to mimic, you know, to look at what some universities are doing where they're ending their semester at Thanksgiving as opposed to middle of December and staying closed for a, for a longer extended period than normal. What um, were we to explore that? How much further back would we have to start, I guess, is the question. Like, that's a math question. <laughs> Dr. Morris. But one thing that is in the power of the school committee uh, is that you have a policy that there's a February break and an April break. Um, that's not negotiated. That's actually in your policy manual. So that is, those are two weeks where even if you did have to take Patriots Day and President's Day off, that's eight school days that could be integrated. Uh, I think the regional approach really matters too, because we do have teachers and staff members who are parents in other districts, and it creates some child care challenges if everybody's on a different schedule. That that may be unavoidable for a whole host of reasons. Um, so I don't want to say that's the only factor, but um, you could suspend that. I'm not suggesting you should, but the school committee certainly could suspend that policy for a year, um, and that buys two weeks essentially of time. So if you think about roughly three and a half, four weeks between Thanksgiving and and the December break, if you started a couple weeks earlier uh, and you're looking to make up a couple weeks, that's another way to think about it. Mr. Demling? You know, when you brought up the, uh, the question of breaks, it made me think of um, a few years ago when, when you started the policy of no homework over uh, the December break and how well that was received by, by students and staff. Um, and then just more broadly of how a break isn't just a, a block of days on a schedule. It, it, it serves a well-being and educational purpose over the flow of the, the year. And speak, it quickly becomes this, this educational issue we're talking about, right? This, this, pet, this I don't know if pedagogy is the right word. Um, but anyway, it's, it's more than just school committee, you know, moving days around. And so, like, in terms of next steps, um, I absolutely, um, you know, with, with the feasibility, the, the cooling feasibility, as, as Mr. Harrington and Dr. Morris mentioned, I, I think the other thing I, I would like to as a, a sort of a next step is, um, you know, and Dr. Morris, you don't have to spend hundreds of hours on this, but in, in your regular meetings with, with, with your colleagues um, and, 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 with, and with staff, um, you know, your curriculum director, director of HR principals, you know, and, and, and teachers, you know, I, I think sort of not just like informally throwing this against the wall, but you know, sharing school committee is seriously starting to explore this. What are some of the big ticket educational theme items, the values that we should be thinking of, the impacts, right? Um, the, the, the we would rather have at least bubble up onto our radar uh, so, sooner rather than later. Uh, Cause I, I, I do want to avoid just thinking about this too narrowly as well we got to maximize the sun and as long as we can cool the buildings then let's just you know barrel on down i don't i don't, I don't want to um uh you know barrel over the the educational uh consideration as well okay any other thoughts on this or questions miss seeker 
It's, I guess it's sort of adding on to maybe uh, what Mr. Demling was saying, but one of the things I'm thinking of is sort of, <laughs> it's broad. How are people around the world doing this? Um, you know, there are different educational models that are, are um, as effective and, and, and how, how does this work? And I realize that is like blue sky and things of, <laughs> there's a large world out here and there's a lot of different um, countries doing things differently, but, you know, we might, we might, learn something from different models too, in terms of when breaks and um, when school is in session and when it's not. And obviously there's environmental factors there too, um, in terms of weather and whatnot, but it just popped into my mind in thinking about that while we're thinking about this, if if that helps in any sort of brainstorming um, yeah. and coming up with ideas. And, and it's an interesting um, thought. I'm intrigued that you brought that up because it's, um, you know, it, it, there's a, another way of thinking of it too, not, not just um, maximizing learning, but also um, reducing the potential learning loss that we know happens over summer when, you know, for example, summer breaks. Um, and thinking, you know, bring that in, particularly given that this year is so challenging. Um, uh, in terms of the learning loss that we had from last spring, so over the summer. So um, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Dancer. Um, we have grandchildren in California who are in a, a different structure. Um, they go for some period of weeks and then they have I think about a three week break and then they go back to school. They do this throughout the year and it may be four, maybe that they have, I'll have to find out four sections of instruction, but um, they've been doing that for a while out where they live. And uh, it's, you know, because they come to visit us when our kids are in school. <laughs> so, um, so it isn't just other countries. There, there are places here that are doing it too. Any other? So, and general sense that we'll keep talking about this and, and sort of exploring this. With, um, a few, I think, next steps for that, that we can sort of work on and sort of bring to a future um, discussion on this continued discussion. Any other closing thoughts? Seeing none. Okay. Great. Um, so our next item is a summary of the Amherst Town Financial Indicators. Um, we had the Amherst member, the school committee members um, of us attended a meeting with the town council and the Jones Library Board of Trustees. Um, where we heard an update from the town staff um, on sort of outlook, both outlook for um, our current fiscal year 21, as well as um, guidance for uh, planning and beginning our budgeting for fiscal year 22. Um, and I, I took copious notes, but I'm, I'm not sure, uh, Dr. Morris, if you want to add um, a summary um, comment ahead of time. Sure. So uh, I'll do the math part of it. Um, so at the regional level, um, the uh, initial estimate was uh, a flat, a level um, budget, which means um, the same amount of money uh, would be available from the town of Amherst for the region this uh, next year as was this year. As you all know, um, that would involve significant financial, um, difficult financial decisions and budget cuts. Uh, because our costs generally go up for a whole host of good reasons year to year. And so if it was flat for the second year in a row from Amherst, um, you know, last year it was flat and, you know, we reduced, I can't remember the exact number, but, you know, over half a million dollars, I believe, are in that neighborhood. Um, and so that would be very difficult. Um, that obviously plays into the regional formula, uh, which is its own challenge between Amherst, Leverett, Pelham, and Shutesbury. Um, but that's what was shared for the Amherst Public Schools. It was listed as, a, I believe, a 0.27 reduction in funds available from uh, for next year as compared to this year, which would also be extremely difficult um, and involve significant budget reductions. Um, so, you know, 
it was it was a um, um, it was a 39 slide presentation with a tremendous amount of information. So I know I'm boiling down to the core elements as it relates to us. Um, I do think the town is being judicious and um, and trying to think about how it um, responds to a pandemic that has significantly reduced the number of people living in Amherst uh, and some of the financial ramifications of that and the you know ramifications on the commercial sector, ramifications on some of the other funds that come from having um, significantly more people living in the community. Uh, I'm not saying I endorse the recommendations, but I do want to, you know, put it in context. It wasn't for the sake of making it difficult. And that was pretty, their financial estimates for FY22 were consistent across departments um, relatively. So that that's sort of the nuts and bolts of what was shared last night. And um, certainly there's more context that anyone could add, but um, it, it gave us the starting point. Uh, it, it, it was one of the factors in the budget freeze that I spoke about earlier, just thinking through what the implications of those are. Um, certainly not, it's a very challenging to think about um, two years in a row of having no financial increase. Um, that, that's, you know, not particularly sustainable in our model. And so, you know, we're trying to do all the things we can do now to make next year um, less severe than it could be. And I'm not sure we'll be successful. Um, given that estimate. So sorry, again, I'm the cold water guy all night, it seems like, but, um, uh, you know, I just want to be transparent and honest about what was shared last night and what the implications are for our two districts. Ms. Do you have your hand up? No. I believe Ms. Stancer does, uh, unless her... her Ray's hand was up. Oh, you have to you have to click on it to take your hand. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, so I believe um, just to sort of uh, we, we scheduled um, our four meeting. Um, we we're talking about the budget and assessment for FY twenty two. Um, scheduled for December fifth, um, Saturday morning. Um, online. Um, and so I think I guess the, the question, and maybe we'll come to this future agenda planning, is sort of um, what are our steps to, to um, between now and then um, on that. Any questions? So all, the, all of our Amherst were at the meeting, but are there any questions from uh, anybody actually on the committee about, um, about the indicators from Amherst? Ms. Fitzer. It's not so much a question as I, I think it, it is more of a comment and kind of wanting to start the conversation about, is there any advocacy we can do for our schools that perhaps keeping us level funded in a year when, and, and actually taking a decrease for our, you know, our elementary schools is, it, <laughs> I'm just very, very concerned about what this is going to mean, um, and 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 I know we're, we're, you know, we've had these conversations about keeping kids in our district, and I honestly have to say, like, this is going to, you know, just make it a lot harder. I think our schools are, um, I think, part of the reason people choose to move to this area of of Western Mass, and I'd like to keep our schools strong, and I'm really concerned about keeping it level at a year when we're going to be asked to, you know, hopefully we'll get back in person. And when we do, we're going to need more resources, not less. And I've been saying this a lot. Um, and so I'm just, I, I, I'm hoping that this was kind of like the starting point, you know, with budgeting, you always have a starting point and then maybe we find out that the state has a little bit more money, you know, and we'll, we'll, things aren't as dark as they seem. But I'm not optimistic this year um, that that's the case. So I, I don't, I'm just curious about, you know, is there anything we can do um, to try to advocate that maybe this, the schools might be deserving of, of some, and just cut us a break in terms of uh, the keeping us level or actually decreasing our funding. And potentially, I don't want to pit you know, departments against departments, and I know that everybody is hurting this year, but we, I, I, I just think we do need to advocate for our schools if there's any way we can, if there's any wiggle room at all. Mr. Deming? 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up that comment because I had the same feeling at the end of that presentation. Um, I think, um, you know, like Dr. Moore says, 39 slides and really the kicker was in one slide, <laughs> you know? So it was 37 slides of how well the town is managing its finances and how well positioned we are with all our debt. And then, oh, everybody's gonna get this massive cut this year. <laughs> so, and, you know, I'm, the, I'm not like, you know, I'm, that sounds a little harsh. I mean, like on the one hand, it could have been worse, you know? And I know, I know some communities it is worse because it's true that Amherst has, um, comparatively speaking, a, a well-run town, you know, well-managed finances. We have the bond rating we have that's, that's deservedly so. Um, but, but I, th I think, we, you know, when you put it in the context of we were level funded last year and now we're level funded this year. And um, I think, you know, a couple of vibes I got from from the from the presentation. One is that they do like I think Dr. Morris's word of judicious is is well, well put. They the, the, the town does have a kind of a vibe of they need to want they want to be very cautious and judicious and conservative in its in its outlays. And so always budget less and. Uh, or yeah, budget budget um, you know more than you need, and um, I don't know if I said that right. Um, uh, but uh, so so I, I, it doesn't surprise me that, that they didn't come out and say, hey, we knew, we really need to like give extra to to a services. I also think that it is really difficult for uh, the town manager in November to say this department gets this and this department gets that, you know, because it is a zero sum game, right? Um, which is what's really difficult about this is that it's a zero sum game. Um, and, uh, so I, th I think, I, I think there is an opportunity to, I don't know if I would call it advocate for the schools when it, when it comes to within the town so much as educate, um, the public and, and have conversations with the town council about where our schools are at with this budget picture and what the cut would mean. Right. Cause I, I, you, cause you heard some of the comments, uh, at, towards the end of the meeting, uh, right. Of like, if you think about this really quickly, oh, the school's enrollment is going down. Therefore they have less expenses. Right. Or, um, and it's, it's, we all know that's really not that simple. Um, so I think, you know, I, I don't sense personally any hostility towards, um, investment in in our schools you know the, the opposite actually I, I feel like you know across the town council spectrum um is just very strong support for public education and wanting to sustain our public schools but i do think there is some uh ed education to be done in terms of describing well this is why it's a lot harder to come back from a double hit two fiscal years in a row for a school than it is for your roads Right or or even even a facilities department. You know, I don't want. I'm not, you know, which one, I'm not talking about staffing. I'm just talking about like the actual trying to recover from because of the enrollment, all the complexities that we understand. So um, it's a hard conversation to have. But I I I, I, I thank you for raising the comment because I I I would agree that we we should probably start to have it. Thank you both. Um, I, I agree. And I also think that it's very similar to the conversation that we just had the, earlier about state funding too. So I sort of could talk, I could talk myself, I, but I do think in our role at the committee, uh, it's our job to advocate for what we think is for our students and our, in our schools, um, knowing that it's, it's going to be a challenge here. So any other, Comments, observations, questions. Not seeing any. Okay. Um, moving on to our next item, which is our um, uh, planning for the uh, JMSC, so that's the Joint Labor Management Safety Committee agenda items. Um, and uh, Ms. Sullivan and Mr. Harrington are our representatives now on that. I'll turn it over to, I think, Mr. Harrington for um, introducing this topic. Yeah, so um, so there's there's a meeting posted on the uh, on the website with with a sort of a brief agenda uh, where we would discuss you know metrics, which has kind of been typical for kind of that that's pretty much how they all open. Uh, 
there are a couple members that are better at math than, than I am, so it's always good to get that input. And then um, we also had on there a facilities update and then future agenda, agenda planning, and then kind of left it open for anything that would come up that we hadn't discussed prior. And, and so because it, we have to follow open meeting law, it had to be posted today rather than tomorrow. So we, we kind of had to move expeditiously there. Um, I also want to note that, that I this afternoon I received a, an email from uh, members of the JLMS, JLMSC, it's so hard to say fast, um, that, from the, the APEA reps for on the on the committee uh, expressing some concern and, and there was sort of a request for uh, to postpone this meeting and I, and I, th I think kind of like looking over it, there it's it's more procedural concern, concerns I think and so I, I I believe that's a discussion we can have in advance of the uh, Friday meeting and, and try to get that to go forward but uh it is a posted meeting and we will be there at four o'clock. I think that's about sums it up for. Um, for a question for um, so on the website, um, anybody from any member of the community or the public will be able to access a link to be able to view this meeting on Friday through that agenda. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That is correct. Um, Ms. Spitzer. I'm sorry, I'm just, I, I guess I didn't follow the update. So there was a request to postpone the meeting, but the meeting's been posted, so it's definitely happening at that time. Could you just clarify, is, is there some possibility that the meeting's not going to happen if, if the APA reps don't show, like do we need to have a quorum in order for that meeting to be held in the same way that we do? And if so, what would be the effect if the APA representatives were not able to make it at that time for whatever reason. Yeah, so the, the part I can clarify with that is that, um, so the, the email re requesting the postponement, the timing on it, I actually just looked at the, the timing that it came in. It co actually literally coincided with when the meeting was being posted. So it now is a posted meeting. And, and as far as, as, as quorum, I don't, I don't believe that's actually written out in the MOA directly, Mr. Morris, or Dr. Morris can clarify that. Yeah, Dr. Morris. Yeah, so uh, the MOA states that each, uh, the, the APA and the district can assign, you know, it's three members, uh, whoever three members are. And just to clarify, my understanding is that Mr. Harrington, and Mr. Sullivan are now a subcommittee of the school committee, it's not that the whole group is. So Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Harrington can't actually have dialogue about this outside the posted meeting. Um, they are the subcommittee. The fact that there's other people who are present at the meeting, like many other meetings, um, you know, is fine. But um, what would be needed is a quorum of those two members um, to have the meeting. If, if there wasn't a quorum of those two members, the meeting could not, could, could not be had. Um, is it, I just ask a question if you could maybe share, share, paraphrase what, what was in the letter so that folks understand, because I'm just wondering, um, what was the reason for the request? You said that it's procedural. Yeah, so, um, so they were looking for some clarification regarding, um, th there was a concern that we were, um, that the school committee was, was had made a decision to turn the uh, JLMSC into a subcommittee of the school committee. So, so that that's something that needs some some clarifying. And um, they, they 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 did state an interest in, in wanting to discuss the matter and, and kind of resolve it in a timely matter manner. So that that's that's like the gist of the. the email. Dr. Morris. Yeah, just to clarify, I think uh, better to give an example than my description earlier. So, for instance, when Miss Lord and Miss um, 
and Ms. Kenny were on the evaluation subcommittee meeting every time there was a meeting. Um, Ms. Lord would call that meeting to order. There were very quick meetings because they almost exclusively went into executive session immediately, but they were posted meetings that were held. And so sometimes I would be there, sometimes Mr. Terry, the attorney, sometimes Doreen Cunningham or Jennifer Ortiz. So we were sort of, we were part of a group that was meeting with the subcommittee, but the subcommittee itself needed to be there for the meeting to occur. So Ms. Lord did not ask for, uh, as chair of that group, she did not ask for my roll call attendance. It wouldn't matter uh, for calling the meeting whether I was there, um, whether it mattered that I was there altogether. It's a matter for Ms. Lord and Ms. Kenny to think about. And, and however they think about it, it's fine. But on a technical level, that was the subcommittee. And the other people who were at that meeting were um, members. And we obviously were were hopefully critical parts of that team. And the same would be true for Mr. Harrington and Mr. Sullivan, that they would um, they need to be there for the meeting to happen. And that's the quorum that would be required um, to, to kind of have that discussion. Um, as this is not negotiations, unlike Ms. Lord and Ms. Kenny's, you know, that went into executive sessions because it was about negotiations. This is, as you know, as was noted earlier, clearly not negotiations. So uh, the meeting would be held in public, but they're the, they're the group that would need the quorum. That comparison was super helpful. <laughs> that, that cleared it up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so to be clear, Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Harrington are the subcommittee of the Regional School Committee, and that's why it needs to be posted within the agenda. Okay. Mr. Sullivan, did you have a raise your hand? Yes. So, so this is just like a meeting of the policy subcommittee instead of four, three or four people. It's just two of us. And then there are other people attending along with us. Is that true? All right. So I just want to remind everybody that I'm these hats that I've been wearing lately. These are my comfort hats because my comfort dog seems to come and go and it's not very comforting anymore. So I need I need the hat because for the first time in six years, I'm beginning to get feedback from Shutesbury families that they, you know. There's less than five cases the entire time in Shutesbury for the COVID, and families are getting really antsy about wanting to get their kids back in school because up here, there's no reason to keep them out. So I need some guidance on what, you know, or where we're supposed to take these conversations. Thank you. Um, I, I think the agenda does include discussion on, on the latest metrics, and I, get, I think the decision, as we spoke at the beginning of this meeting, um, if the JLC, uh, the, any discussion about metrics and the and way that our, our decision framework um, for closing schools would to be brought back to the PEA and, and the regional school committee to reopen negotiations. So we end our meeting back where we started. Um, the, is there any other uh, comment or discussion on the item? Great. So we'll move on to a future agenda. Um, and I believe because uh, two weeks from now is the week of um, Thanksgiving, we are planning to meet next Tuesday said. Um, oh, thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, so we are going to, I think, come back the uh, OA with the AFSCME that is still outstanding. We were waiting um, for that to be on by, by that group. Um, high school graduation requirements so we're, um, the regional school committee will be um, looking at that later this evening. Um, MF advocacy and um, winter sports, because we are still um, in a remote learning situation, the school committee, regional school committee will need to in on or not we, we hold uh, winter sports. I believe we're waiting on guidance from MAA. They haven't issued Dr. Morris? Yeah, so uh, just to clarify that point, not to go into discussion, but the EEC put out their um, guidance, I wanna say on Friday, 
uh, which is a state state government agency. And now that the MIA has that, uh, we're hoping that by the time we meet next Tuesday, um, they've taken that feedback into account and shared something. If not, we may want to push that um, in terms of decision making. But I still think the EC guidance is enough where uh, it'd be worth the committee having some discussion because it does list school specific uh, rules, uh, what sports can happen, can't happen, and, and some conditions. So um, I, I'd like to leave it on the agenda, even if my MIA doesn't, especially because we won't be meeting the next week, at least have some initial dialogue on that topic. That'd be great. Can you expand that potentially to hear on how the fall sports went? And then we'll be coming and hearing about uh, the distance learning activities that um, that we heard sort of initially a week ago, um, and so sort of more detail and, and then of that and um, potential uh, way to address that. Are there any missing items that folks like to see next week? If, um, if anything does occur to you um, after this meeting, if you email me um, tomorrow, it would be awesome. And we can look at that um, for them. Uh, warrant report. I do have two. Spitzer, do you have any for region? Right, would you like to go first? Um, I think I just have one. So if, if you can, I, I'm happy to. Um, just give me one moment. Sorry for the delay. So um, I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $568,886.18 for the warrant dated November 6, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $296,267.82, revolving fund expenses, expenses of $47,372.35, Grant fund expenses of $225,096.01, and other funds in the amount of $150, uh, which was for gifts. And I signed this on November 6th. Um, and I have two, um, the first one. Um, I, Allison Donald, authorized by my switch tables, the amount of $168,872.77. For a warrant dated October 23rd, 2020. This includes general fund expenses $52,500.88, revolving fund expenses of $26,500, grant fund expenses of $2,138.73, FEMA fund of $19,224.41, COVID relief grant in the amount of $5,194. CARES Act fund $62,611.75. And I signed that on November 2nd, 20. And more. I have a spinning wheel. I, Allison McDonald, authorized by signature to payables of forty-seven thousand four hundred and twelve dollars forty-seven cents. Warrant dated November thirteenth, twenty twenty. This is general fund expenses of fifteen thousand. Uh, this is uh, a thousand eight hundred and sixty dollars twenty-four cents. Um, revolving fund expenses of Yes, $15,865, sorry, and 24 cents. Um, 2, 000, uh, revolving expenses of $2,160. Grant fund expenses of $302.05. COVID grant fund 
$4,141.67, CARES Act Fund $24,605.77, Project Bread $207.74, and I saw that today, November 10th, 2020. That is all warrants, um, and I don't believe we have any games tonight. Um, so we'll move on. Uh, I move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee at 6 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald and seconded by Smith. And the discussion, I'll take your call vote. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Good night. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The Amherst School Committee is adjourned. And we're all still here. Um, and moving on to the regional only item of graduate requirements for the class of 2021. And I believe there's a memo in our packets. Dr. Morris? Sure. So uh, as, as um, was noted, um, we can, uh, and I'm not asking for a vote tonight, but I wanted to share uh, the proposal that came from the high school administration. If there's any questions, I can answer them or bring them back to the high school administration to make sure you have answers before you vote. But um, I think the memo um, says it pretty clearly. So I think I'm gonna, just gonna read it for the sake of viewers um, so they don't have to double back to the packet. The ARHS High School Administration recognizes that 88 question credits are required for graduation. This was the requirement when, ARPS, when, when ARHS excuse me, was in a trimester schedule of 15 blocks that allowed for students to earn 30 credits per year. When the high school changed its, uh, the master schedule to a seven block schedule in 2017-2018, students could earn a total of 28 credits each year, but the total credits required for graduation was maintained at 88. With the most recent change to a three by three block, which is in response to um, the guidelines as a result of COVID and the prioritization of students having fewer transitions in the school day with fewer classes to focus on during a remote or hybrid schedule, the majority of students will earn 24 credits this year. The high school administration recommends that the high school graduation requirements be adjusted to 84 total credits for this class of 2021 and beyond to acknowledge that students had fewer opportunities to earn 88 credits with a change in schedules. This reduction is equivalent to one full year course or two elective courses. The change will increase the graduation rate for Amherst students and we believe it's our responsibility and obligation to adjust this requirement as a result of the unforeseen schedule change combined with the change to semesters and the resulting effect the student, the schedules had on student credit attainment. Uh, I'm gonna put it in, in layman's terms, um, which is uh, as students have had the opportunity to have fewer and fewer credits, both with the change in schedule from trimester to semester and then particularly this year, the margin for error for students on their credits, um, if they do struggle in a course, has gotten narrower and narrower. And at this point, the high school administration, and I agree with them and endorse their view, feels like it, it's more narrow than, than we want it to be. Um, the wiggle room yet, students had if they, they were having struggling and needed to take a study instead of a course, um, a credit bearing course, or just if they were struggling a course, uh, we always want to build in that. We want to support our students. We know that the students in their high school career do uh, have ups and downs. And right now it feels like that that wiggle room that we wanna provide students has gotten just in, too narrow for our comfort level. And we know that the students who are, will be most affected by maintaining it at 80 or 88 um, are students who, who tend to have more challenges um, being successful in the academic content in schools. Um, so when we looked at it from an equity perspective and um, a student perspective, uh, we feel like we've, we've shrunk the chances to have struggles and challenges uh, and still graduate on time uh, through no fault of the students. It's because we've changed the schedule twice now over the students' careers uh, at the high school. So that's why we're making this request um, and I'm happy to answer any questions or take any comments. Uh, and if I don't know the answer again, I'll loop back and, and we can have Tolliver, Mickey or Sam come on next time to, um, to be able to answer anything that I can. Thank you. Ms. Stancer. Um, I, think, I think I have a couple of questions. Um, are students limited to 24 credits? Could a student have more than 24 credits this year? 
So that's where the, the three by three plus one schedule comes in because students do have the opportunity for a plus one block. Um, they do have the opportunity to have more of that plus one block uh, tend to not, it doesn't meet 90 minutes a day. So it is a little bit more self-directed, uh, which is working great for some students. And for some students, um, that's not the best option for them who are maintaining, you know, a pretty intensive look at three courses. And so um, the majority of students are somewhere in that range, but we wanted to, again, look at uh, the students who would be at risk of not graduating and prioritize the credits they're taking. And if students take more, that's fabulous, and that looks great for those students who are applying for uh, post-high school um, either careers or college applications, but uh, we just wanted to make right-size the expectation we have for, for all students. Okay, and I guess the other question is, I don't know how this fits. Um, are there a certain number of credits required by the state for a high school education, and how does this fit into that? So that one is much more about the local requirements we set plus the MCAS requirement, uh, which is a state requirement. So for us, it would still maintain, um, you know, a commitment. And we did look at uh, where, where this often comes up is not so much at, at the state level, but at the college level. Um, some colleges require a certain number of credits or a certain number of years in each discipline or domain. Uh, we don't feel like that would be affected. It would be much more about making sure that students uh, are able to graduate in time if they perhaps chose not to take an elective course um, because they wanted an additional study period so that they could be you know, successful in completing the courses they need to pass the MCAS and graduate. Okay, thank you. Thanks, those are really good questions, appreciate it. Um, thank you for bringing up MCAS, that's what I was going to ask whether um... That will be another vote if there is a moratorium for students who either moved into the district or we're going to plan on taking it again, either junior or senior year, since it's kind of hokey. It is hokey. That's the right word. Um, and so uh, more soon on that, that's certainly a lot of superintendents' minds, and it's come up multiple times in our meetings with Desi. Um, so this, one, this vote that we'd be asking you to take next week is, is exclusively about the credit piece. Um, and that's what's in the local control at the moment is how many credits uh, you all would um, require for high school graduation. The MCAS is going to be a bigger fish to fry down the road. Just a quick follow up. Would it be, sorry, so it is a bigger fish to fry. Would it, is now the time to get people to contact our state representatives and have you know, in support of the MGAS moratorium? I think oh, my agenda for next week. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, they, they, can, they can hold on for seven days until the robust conversation you'll all have next week. Miss <laughs> um, Seeger. So this is, this is relatively new to me, being new on this committee. Um, and I realize that COVID is not only affecting the seniors, but the juniors, the sophomores and the freshmen. Um, as well. Um, hopefully, when the eighth graders get into the high school and stuff, that'll even out a little bit across their time there. If we change these now, is this sort of like a permanent change going forward? Do you see this beyond the students who are in the high school now affecting affecting the students who are now in seventh and eighth grade, or would we change it sort of back, or is this something that you think is like a long run better kind of change? So, you know, we put the language in there specifically uh, that um, class of 2021 and beyond. And some of that's because we can't really predict what next year will look like. Um, but I do think for students who are currently at the high school, um, that'll be a factor since middle school credits don't apply to high school graduation. It's a little too early to say about um, for students at that level, but for anyone, you know, uh, ninth through 12th graders right now, their credits are going to be a little wacky because they're having a year that doesn't really conform to our pre-existing um, structures as it relates to credits. Any other questions from? Could I give the opportunity again? And she certainly can pass as she always has to Ms. Gripko if she has anything she'd like to add on this particular topic. Um, not really that much. I just think that it, this is a good idea. I think that it would take a lot of stress off of um, some students for, you know, trying to achieve these credit goals. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Any other questions? Great. So as we just discussed, the planning will be coming back to this again next week. I think that uh, we have for this evening. So I will make another motion to um, adjourn the regional committee. Is there a second? Second. I move second by stance. Um, and we'll take a roll. Mr. Dan. Tell my eye. Mr. Harrington. Frank and I. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, I. Ms. Lord. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, I. Am I going out? <laughs> Ms. Lord. Yeah, I think she said Miss Lord. Yeah, um, Ms. Victor? Uh, Spitzer, uh, I. <laughs> Stancer, I. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, I. McDonald's. Did I know Yep. Um, we are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>